Good evening. Good to be with you this evening. Good to be back with the church. Always good. We continue again this evening in the Footprints of Faith preaching series. Um, this evening, we're going to talk about Balaam. Uh, doesn't have a lot of ink, but a lot of lessons that we can learn from Balaam. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 22, we're going to begin there. We're going to talk about Balaam in the way that we normally do. We're going to talk about who he was, what he did, and what we can learn from it. And I'm really hoping that we get there. There we go. Thank you. We're going to talk about Balaam, specifically Balaam the son of Beor. Uh, in case you were wondering which Balaam we were going to talk about, it's this one. So, like I said, we'll begin by talking about who he was, talk about what he did, and then draw off the lessons that we can from his life. To begin, who he was. Well, Balaam was a prophet of God, of Jehovah God. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16, Peter calls him a prophet in referencing how his donkey had spoken to him to try to cure the madness of the prophet. And then if you look at verse 6 of Numbers 22, he was sought by the king of Moab named Balak. And it says, therefore, this is the king of Moab speaking about Balaam, Therefore, please come at once and curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know, said the king of Moab, I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. And later we're going to read where Balaam talks about the fact that he is a prophet of God, and that he can only speak those things which God has given him to speak. So Balaam was a prophet of God. But at what time period? Well, at this time, Israel is making their way from the wilderness into the promised land. They haven't crossed over yet to take possession. So Balaam is one of those prophets that we read about in the Old Testament that's not tied to Israel. Keep in mind, what is the nation of Israel? The nation of Israel are those descendants of Abraham, right? We had Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and his family went into Egypt, 72 souls, and they came out of Egypt, two and a half million, we can talk about how many, but a great nation. And the Bible follows that nation. Well, Balaam is not of the nation, not of a descendant of Abraham, but he is still a prophet of Jehovah God. Like in Genesis chapter 14, we are introduced to a, a priest of the Most High God named Melchizedek in Genesis 14. And wouldn't you like to know more about Melchizedek? Yes. He appears on the scene, he is a priest of the Most High God, and then he's gone, just a couple of verses. We learn a lot about him and about God typically, but we don't have a lot of information. Where was he from? Well, he was from Salem. Well, that doesn't really help. <laughs> we just don't know much about him. What else do we know? Well, in chapter 24 of Genesis and in chapter 28, chapter 24 Abraham was seeking a wife for his son Isaac. But he didn't want his son to marry a Canaanite because of the religious practices and other things. So you remember, he sent him back home, up to the north, to Haran. Haran is up here, Israel is down here. This was just a map, I'll, I can explain to you later why I chose this map. Um, so there is Haran. You remember when Abraham received the call, he and his family left Ur of Chaldees, which had been over here somewhere. 
They came up here and they stayed in Haran until Terah, Abraham's father, died. Then Abraham and Haran's son Lot traveled down into the promised land. Well, Balaam lives right about here. Pethor is the name of the city, and it was just south of Carchemish on the river, the Euphrates there. So that's where he's from. So he's right here from that area. There are Jehovah God worshipers here. The rest of Abraham's family who did not come down. That's why Isaac got his bride from up in Haran, because at least they would be Jehovah God worshipers. And then later in Genesis 28, Jacob uh, is sent by Isaac. Where does he go? He goes back up to Haran, where the family is, where Laban is, where he's going to meet his daughters, a daughter he wanted. And again, the reason is, here are Jehovah God worshipers. Well, a good deal of time has gone by, and yet Balaam lives up here, and he's still a prophet of Jehovah God. It's an interesting thing because one of the things I would love to know more about is the prophets of God and how God was working outside of the line of Israel. I, I would just be curious to know those things. And, and when we have characters come in like Balaam, like Melchizedek, and, and maybe like Cornelius in the New Testament, it's fascinating how they got there. And I'd love to know the backstory, but... So that's what he was, who he was. He was a prophet of God, and this is probably why, because he was from right there in that area. Who else was he? He was the one that was called upon by the king of Moab to stop Israel. This is Israel's travels from the wilderness. This is them traveling in the wilderness for the 40 years, and now they've headed here, They've gone up, they've snuck through Moab, and they've already fought against um, Ammon and defeated them. So that's where Israel is, just to the north. It says they're just opposite Jericho on this side of the Jordan. And Moab is right here and concerned about, again, how many people? A huge army that already dealt with uh, Egypt long before the Amalekites here, the Amorites up here, and are getting ready to move into Canaan. So he was called to come and be the one that would curse them. I guess we could get into a little bit of this. There's going to be some fighting with the Midianites. You see that down here? Remember, these are all family folks. Moab and Ammon were the children of of Lot with his daughters, okay? So their family. Edom are the descendants of Esau, family. So when they were traveling to get into the promised land and they were going to go through Edom, you remember God forbade them from fighting them. You may not fight them. Well, we'll ask them for water and if we can go through their land. You remember what the Edomites said? Edomites said? No. So what did they have to do? They had to basically go around their nation. They went through Moab to get at the Ammonites who came to fight them. But again, Israel is forbidden for fighting and destroying these people because they're family. And God's promises hold true. So that's who he was. A prophet of God from up in the area of Haran who was called down by the king of Moab to try to deal with this situation with Israel. Let's go ahead and read 22, verse 7. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand, and they came to Balaam, and they spoke to him the words of Balak. Okay? So... They have traveled, whoop. they have Midianites working together with Moabites to fight against Israel, and the elders of these two nations have gone all the way up north of Aram to talk to Balaam, to get him to come and curse. 
That's who he was. What did he do? He inquired of God. He's a prophet. He inquired of God. Verse 8. So Balaam receives the elders from Moab, and he receives the elders from Midian. And he said to them, Lodge here tonight, and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. And I wish I could put a pin in it right there and say, and that's the story of Balaam. But unfortunately it's not. He did good. He went to God and he said, these people are asking me to come and to curse this other people that they might overcome them. And God says, you will not go with them. You will not curse this people because this people are blessed, Israel. So what did he do? He inquired of God. Here's the problem. What else did he do? He inquired again. Look at the next verse. Verse, well, look at verse 18. So what has happened is the elders from Moab and Midian have gone back home and said he wouldn't come. So Balak took that, took that as maybe he wants a little more uh, encouragement. So he sends princes instead of just some elders, and he sends a lot more goods and money to try to get Balaam to do this. And they arrive. And they come to him, and verse 16, And they came to Balaam, and they said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor, Please, let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say to me. Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. And Balaam should have answered, God has already spoken. These people are blessed. They cannot be cursed. God has already told us the answer. But how did he respond in verse 18? Then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his whole house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Again, wonderful. Now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. What's that about? God has spoken about this. Does he think God's going to change his mind? Why is he going to ask a second time? Did you see all the gold and stuff they brought? Do you see all the promises they made? The king of a great nation said that whatever I say, he will do, and he will bless me and, and take care of me. Whew. Let's go see what God has to say. Verse 20, And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Did, did God change his mind, brethren? Is God going to say, go ahead now and, and curse him? No. I think what we see here, in layman's terms, I think God's feeding Balaam a little bit of rope, if you know what I mean. God's already spoken on the topic. Don't go with them. They will not be cursed. They are going to be blessed. Uh, hey, God, um, what do you think? You know, maybe should I, what should I do? Okay. If this is the way you're going, Balaam, 
go ahead, but only speak what I tell you to speak. So there's a sense here, kind of like we talked about this morning in the Bible class, where God's going to kind of use Balaam's sin, which is lust and desire for power and wealth, to make a better point or a stronger point with regards to Israel being his people. So, again, he asked once, he asked twice. What else did Balaam do? He got in an argument with a donkey, which not many of us can say that we've done. Uh, you may have been angry with the donkey and disappointed in the donkey, but you don't have a lot of arguments with the donkey, but he did. But look at verse 22. What did God say? Second time he was asked, go ahead, go. Then God's anger was roused because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Why is God angry? Didn't God tell him to go? Again, you've got to look at how this is trans transpiring. God didn't want him to go. God told him not to go. Now he's asked to go a second time, and God is saying, fine, go ahead, but you're only going to speak the things that I say. You're not going to curse them. You're going to bless them. What does God know that Balaam is seeking to do? Balaam is seeking to curse. It's the only way he gets the stuff. It's the only reason to make the journey. God knows this, and he's angry because of it. And so the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. Now the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his strong sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Donkey says, no, we're going to get off the path and go into this field. So Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, so he struck her again. Here's a narrow area where she can get by, and so she's squeezing by on one side of the wall to be as far away from the angel with the sword as she can be and crushes his foot. I don't think like he's crippled. I think it's just like, ouch. So he strikes the donkey again. Verse 26, Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused, and he struck the donkey with his staff. So this time the donkey sees there's nowhere to go. There's the angel and plops down on the ground. And for that, gets struck yet again. Here comes the argument. Verse 30, excuse me, <clears throat> verse 28. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? And Balaam said to the donkey, let's stop for a second. Right? Kind of like in the garden. And the serpent said, that, okay, wait a minute. Something, something's going on. So Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me. I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. Not having a good day. So the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, no. That's the end of the argument. But then the angel enters. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand and he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And what did he say? Verse 34, and Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Thou fair, now therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Again, I won't go if you don't want me to go, God. You want to go. You're going to go. 
Then the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I speak to you, that you shall speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. So he inquired of God. He inquired of God again. He got in the argument with the donkey. Now he's with Balak. Here he is, and what does he seek to do? He seeks to curse Israel. And three different times, in three different places, he seems to be moving uh, from higher to lower on mountain peaks. The first time they're on a mountain and they look out, and let me show you where they are. They're right here around Mount Nebo, because right there is Pisgah is right nearby. Um, and they're looking over the huge group of people. And what has Balaam told them to do? Build seven altars. Offer seven cows and seven uh, rams on them. What, what's he trying to do? He's trying to work his prophet stuff. He's trying to do the cursing. And what happened? Three times. Strike one. He blesses Israel instead of cursing them. They move to another mountaintop. And what happens? Sets it up, gets the sacrifices. Strike two, he blesses Israel instead of curses. And then the third time on another mountaintop, strike three. He tries to curse again, and he cannot do it. He ends up blessing Israel three times against his will. And how did that section end? Verse 25, then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. <laughs> I'd rather you didn't speak. Don't try to curse them because every time you do, you bless them. So Balaam answered and said to Balak, did I not tell you saying all that the Lord speaks that I must do? Does it sound like he's a good guy there? Well, we've seen a lot about his heart. Well, that's all we hear from him except for a strange thing that happens several chapters later. What else did Balaam do? Balaam was killed because of his sins against Israel. Well, what are you talking about? Well, at chapter 25, we have Israel's sin in Moab. Now Israel, verse 1, remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. Remember, the women of Moab came into the camp of Israel and enticed them into many things, but one of the things they were enticed into was the worship of Baal. And because of that, God sent a plague among Israel. And if you look down at verse 9, those who died in the plague were 24,000 Israelites. Okay, well, what does that have to do with Balaam? Well, turn over to Numbers 31. And the Lord, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take vengeance on the Midianites for the children of Israel. Afterward, you shall be gathered to your people. God says, I remember what they did to you along the way the way they seduced you and caused me to plague you and 24,000 of you to die. Go and take your revenge now against Midian. Look down at verse 8. So they gathered an army and they attacked Midian. And they killed the kings of Midian with the rest of those who were killed, Evi, Recham, Zur, Hur, and Reba. The five kings of Midian, Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword. What? What's he doing in Midian? Look at verse 15 and 16. Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women, they caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Put it together, what do we see? 
Moab tried to hire Balaam to curse Israel, and he couldn't do it three times. What did he do? Here's what he did. He knew God, and he said, I can't curse them, but here's what you do. Entice them to engage in false worship, and God will kill them, and you won't have to worry about it. And that's what happened. 24,000 were killed. And as a result, Balaam paid for his sin. That's who he was. That's what he did. That's all we know about him. What can we learn? Take heed lest you fall. Who was he in the beginning? He was a prophet of the Most High God. And what happened? He was killed at the behest of God by God's people. What happened? His fall. What was the cause of his fall? James 1, 13 through 17. What's the source of all sin? Our desires. And we feed those desires. And when those desires bear fruit, brings forth sin, which brings forth death. Take heed. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done in the past. What matters always is right now. These first three are kind of all related. Um, the second thing we can learn is that God is not mocked. Balaam thought himself a prophet of God. How many times did Balaam crow, if you will, to the people around him, I can but speak the words of God. And yet he was striving to do exactly counter the will of God. God was not mocked. That's why God was angry. That's why God sent the angel. And that's why God eventually had him killed. God understands who we are. It doesn't matter who we think we are, who we say we are. That's the next point. There's reputation and there's character. Reputation is who people think you are. Character is who you actually are. Reputation can be wrong, as it was with Balaam. Character is the fact. And he went from being a prophet of God to being a byword, a proverb, a bad example to be mentioned. Turn over to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14. He's mentioned in 2 Peter 2 and verse 16 as an example of a, a false teacher who gets punished. But look at Revelation 2 and verse 14, talking about Pergamus, the so-called compromising church. Look what it says. He says, but I have a few things against you, in verse 14, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. We're well over a thousand years after that event. And yet God, our Lord, speaking to his church is saying, there are some of you who are committing the same sin as Balaam. He was once, what was his reputation? What did Balak say his reputation is? You're a prophet of God. Who you curse is cursed. Who you bless is blessed. What did he become? Oh, you're like Balaam. A proverb. Last thing we can learn from Balaam, God's will will be done. What did God tell Balaam first thing about Israel? They are blessed. What's the result of all of Balaam's work? He got 24,000 killed, but he blessed them three times, and they entered the land, and they took possession of all the land. God's will will be done. The same is true today, brethren. God's will will be done. He has declared that those who conform themselves to the image of his son, he will save. And he has said that those who do not know him and do not obey his gospel will be greeted with fiery vengeance when Jesus returns. That is the will of God and it is so. In Philippians 2, in verse 10 and 11, we read that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. 
You understand, that's fact. That is the will of God. It will happen. Nothing can stop it from happening. The only thing that we can control is whether we bow and kneel willfully, lovingly, or we are crushed to our knees. God's will will be done. But here's the great news, the greatest news. God's will will be done, and it has been revealed. And we can play a part. We can be on the side that wins. That would be Christ. Be His. Overcome the world as He overcame the world. And have everlasting life with the Father in heaven. It is yours if you will it. Or, you can become a byword. A proverb like Balaam, not serve God, but serve self, our own desires. The choice that our loving and gracious God always has given is ours. I love him for that. I get to determine my fate. I get to decide. You, doesn't matter who you were, doesn't matter what you've done, right now, you can decide righteousness, Christ-likeness, everlasting life. Do you want that? If you've never been baptized into the body of Christ, why not this evening? Why wait? As Ananias said to Paul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Why not this evening? Only those who are in the body of Christ shall be saved. Christians, a lot of distractions in this world. A lot of things trying to grab our attention and get us to put our focus where it ought not be. And we can think, the greatest deception in the world is self-deception. We can think because we've come in this building and done our thing that we're good with God, but God is not mocked. He knows our hearts, and He knows our minds, and He knows every second of our lives. Are you His? He knows, and you should know. If you've not been acting like His, make the change right now. And if there's anything we can do to help you, don't wait. Come forward as together we stand and sing.